Hello and welcome to the CEO Show at the CEO Magazine. This is your host, Nick Vedia, with yet another awesome, awesome panel discussion. Let me share with you a thought that I just conceived a few minutes ago. We all know that properly executed mission or mission statements are like rocket fuel for entrepreneurs. However, some try to marginalize it by saying that it is business 101. But I think they're missing the point. Of course, it is business 101. Yet, 80% of businesses fail within 18 months largely due to missing out on business 101s. So anybody who derides business 101, in my mind, is delusional at best. Based on our own mission statement, this show is not only about CEOs, but more importantly, for CEOs. And by our definition, CEOs are people who say to themselves that the buck stops with me. I have the power and the responsibility to change what I do not like. So this video is a panel discussion to bring you closer to that goal. You will find some deep, deep insights that enable the creation and execution of mission, vision, and values. Some very bright and experienced people brainstormed on the concept and its value to CEOs. The panel consists of Lucas Donut, CEO of Tiny Rebellion, Cordell Norton, an accomplished keynote speaker on revenue management, Matt Barney, the former head of Infosys Leadership Institute, Chris Dugan, adjunct faculty at Singularity University, and yours quarterly as the moderator. Listen to them and decide for yourself what you want to do today, this week, this month, or this year. So here's Thank the panel you discussion for you. joining me today. Welcome to the CEO show, uh, sponsored by the CEO magazine. And I'm really excited that we have four people talking about a topic that uh, is maligned a lot in the media oftentimes by people. But at the same time, you have companies like Google and Ted that have these lofty mission uh, value statements and vision statements. And so what I wanted to do today was to have your expertise level, your experience in dealing with a lot of different clients to talk about mission, vision, vision and value in, in sort of a depth uh, so that we can really identify. It's not that it works or doesn't work, helps or doesn't help, but what, what are the factors that really enable companies and executives to elevate their performance, company performance, individual performance, and uh, oftentimes it fails miserably. Companies have mission statements and they're completely useless. So before we go there, we'll just have a quick uh, introduction from each one. Um, and so if you don't mind, Lucas, why don't we start with you? Yes, my name is Lucas Donet and I am the CEO of Tiny Rebellion, an advertising agency in Santa Monica, California. Thank you for joining, joining us, Lucas. Uh, Cordell, would you help us know a little bit more about yourself? I'm Cordell Norton, and uh, I'm the author of a book titled Business Charisma, How Great Companies Engage and Win Customers Again and Again. Excellent. And what about you, Chris? Uh, my name is Chris Duggan. I'm the CEO and co-founder of BetterWorks. Uh, we're headquartered here in Silicon Valley, and we make software that helps companies do uh, enterprise goal setting and goal management at scale. Excellent. And you also a faculty with Singularity, right? That's correct. Yeah, I also uh, I'm an adjunct uh, uh, professor at Singularity University. Wonderful. I actually just happened to have had a, a long conversation with Ismail um, Salim Ismail. He's the co-founder of Singularity. Yeah, yeah. And so he, he talked about a lot about mission. So Chris, why don't we begin with you? And what we want to do is to understand from your perspective, what are your thoughts? And I will begin with a contrarian perspective, which is, you know, mission statements are lofty, ideals, uh, placards, and, and things posted all over the world, but they do nothing for organizations. Is that true? I uh, no, absolutely disagree. Uh, so I think it's, it's critical as a business leader to set a clear direction for the company and then to connect that direction with the hearts and the minds of the people that work there. And, uh, you know, we've seen so many studies from Gallup and others around the lack of engagement in the workplace and people feeling more disconnected than ever and overwhelmed and overloaded. And, uh, you know, for me, the real opportunity for companies is to think about how do we give our people purpose? How do we connect the dots with uh, what's important and what they're working on? And, you know, these people spend most of their lives at work. 
And you know, there's such a huge missed opportunity if we don't connect the work that they do with the objectives of the company and really align the entire organization in a, in a very compelling way. So I think that starts with mission and then quickly turns into thinking about goals as well. Cordell, what do you have to add to that? Um, Disney, uh, excuse me, Google in their uh, initial offering as a company, that initial offering was 18,000 words. And yet what people really remember is the do no evil, that part of, their, of who Google is. And so the ability to connect with the customer is a, a plus going in, in the future. Um, I think of Disney, who on all their cups and everything, their, their motto is, we make memories. We help you make memories. And so this connection with the customer is essential anymore. Customer service isn't enough. People are moving to customer experiences, and then there's a movement beyond customer experiences where people are saying, we need to build a personal relationship with the customer. And so you've got... Starbucks, when you walk in, they put your name on the cup. They want to connect with the customer now. And that requires connecting quickly in your mission statement, something that's repeatable and that connects with everybody. And to, to some extent, I think it's you're right. It's tied to the branding concept. Uh, just do it, for example, or as TEDx says, ideas worth spreading. Uh, th there is a psychological factor as well. I mean, there's, there's the idea of uh, as, as Chris said, uh, galvanizing the organization uh, to get a sense of purpose, to get a, get a mission statement, but also additionally, the customer connects much better when they remember a tagline. So there's the branding aspect is, is what you're talking about. Lucas, what's, what's your thinking on that? Yeah, well, it's, it's interesting because I have a dual role. I am also, I'm the CEO of the advertising agency, Tiny Rebellion, but I'm also the CMO of a company that has been a client of ours for many years that just went public in May. And as part of that, in the S1 filing, the company is TrueCar. And the vision statement for TrueCar is to prove that truth and transparency is a more profitable way of doing business. It was interesting because the banker said, well, that's a marketing statement. That has no place in the S1. And it's really not a marketing statement. It's the reason for being. It's the why of the company. It's what drives everything we do in the organization. But it was a fascinating conversation because it was deemed by bankers to be a marketing statement versus a reason for being in the world that will drive the purpose of that business uh, for the lifetime of that of the lifetime of that business. So very interesting conversation around is a purpose or vision statement a marketing or branding statement or is it why the company exists and something that pervades every aspect of the business right. and what it does? And ultimately we realize uh, as consumers and, and also companies uh, realize that, you know, if the marketing is devoid of uh, elements of truth in there, then they will recognize it and then the whole thing will become pretty much useless and in fact detrimental to the growth of, of the organization and the trust is lost. You know, you can't take a BMW that drives like a Yugo <laughs> and expect to say it's ultimate driving machine. That's right. That's absolutely right. And I think with transparency and big data and the access of that, that everybody has via their mobile phone, the, the authenticity of brands is just no longer optional. It's what will drive the success of business going forward. There's no way to fake it anymore. Especially in these times when... Uh, information is all pervasive and uh, it takes a few seconds for anybody to know anybody else's experience on Twitter or, or Facebook and anything else. So I think it's, it, it is all the more imperative that marketing is true to its meaning and, and aligned directly with, with the mission statement of the organization and, and their action. So basically your words need to be aligned. But here's the thing. I have worked with several organizations in the past and I remember one where it was a long winded mission statement. And many organizations have those mission statements and they mean nothing. I mean, you see the organization completely devoid of what they claim to be. So, Chris, have you come across organizations like that? And what does it really take? Why, why do they work and why do they not work? So, you know, and I think it's, uh, it's a, I think it's a nice to have what we're saying here, which is, you know, that it's very marketing friendly or that there's a marketability to the, the mission statement. I think that's a, an extra plus. But, you know, maybe what uh, you're saying is there needs to be a core purpose of the company 
that needs to be clearly communicated. It can be with lots of steak or lots of sizzle, but it just needs to be uh, clear and, and clarifying for the organization. And then that is going to set a set of strategic principles and programs in place that are going to be required for the company to execute against those. And you know, where I actually see companies falling down uh, even more so is in the translation of the strategic plan to how they actually end up executing. And, and that's not a surprise when you're talking about you know, a leadership of 10 or 100 people in the company uh, needing to communicate with tens of thousands of people in the organization. Uh, you know, it's not surprising that uh, you know, organizations have a challenge with that translation of the strategic plan to the actual execution with the people in the field and the people that are out there touching the customers and, and, and whatnot. So I think that's where really there's a big opportunity. So, so Cordell, do you think that the failure happens in the communication level? And, and let me point out an, uh, a, a psychological experiment that was done a long time ago. By the way, my background is in educational psychology and statistics. Uh, but there was this experiment where they put down, I think, 10 or 15 people in a line and communicated a message verbally to one person, and that person was supposed to communicate to the next, and so on and so forth. By the time it reached the end, it was all convoluted and nothing resembling the original message. The... Uh one of the, the Hewlett Packard, uh, Hewlett said, 80% of strategy is about marketing. He says, in fact, it's too important to be left to the marketing department. And I, and I think what he's saying is that if the message doesn't communicate down to everybody else, it will get lost. Uh, I love the concept of a BHAC, a big, hairy, audacious concept. Uh, when Columbus crossed the, went to, get the heads of Europe to fund his trip, his strategic plan, he said, don't go south and turn left, go right across the ocean. And it was such a unique story that it made other people stand, it made him stand out. And that's what the strategic plans need today is that repeatability both by employees and by customers. And if it doesn't resonate emotionally, it's not going to fly, no matter what the mission statement is. It's got to be something that's memorable and repeatable. That's very interesting. That is very interesting. I think there's a psychological factor that people need to understand about mission statement. It's not just cognitive that this is my passion, this is this is what I want to do as a as an entrepreneur, as a CEO, but also you've got to recognize that it's not just for you, it's for a bunch of stakeholders, including your internal ones and external ones. And so it needs to be something that's easy, something that you can hold on to. And, and that's that's important. Otherwise when you see long winded mission statements, customer experience and customer satisfaction, you know, it, it goes over it, it. I don't know what you said. Yeah. It's well, interesting too. Go, yes, ahead. Sir. go ahead. Nick, this is Matt Barney. I, I'm also an organizational psychologist. I'm the founder and CEO of LeaderAmp. And the science is very clear that the mission statements have to come alive for people, right? The words are a piece of it, but it's what they see day in, day out. And just prior to LeaderAmp, I lived in India. I worked for the founders of Infosys, which would hire 50,000 people a year, 165,000 people in 80 countries. And if you don't have a very compelling emotional commitment to the meaning of that mission, you wouldn't see those behaviors consistently performing well quarter on quarter. And so the day-to-day the -day reality of that mission is a big deal when it comes to really changing people's attitudes, beliefs, and behaviors in the workplace. And Matt, I, I must apologize. It just so happens, and I don't know what you're looking at, but in my screen, I see uh, I see everybody accepting you for some reason. So I, I see everyone in gallery view. So if you put it in gallery view, I, I see all, all of you. It is in gallery view as well for me. And, oh, okay. and for some reason, I don't see you. And I think that's that's my uh, technology mistake for some sort. But I'll, I'll keep in mind that though I'm not seeing you, you are there. And so what you said uh, makes perfect sense because ultimately it's the culture of an organization that drives results and a mission statement is supposed to sort of epitomize that concept but if it doesn't translate into the culture then it's pointless it's like having a car uh, for someone who doesn't know how to drive it will make no difference but only when you pair the actor with the instrument so to speak and that's when you will see results so, uh, and, and, and Lucas was going to add something to it, so I just wanted to give him some time there. Yeah, thank you. It's
It's also the North Star, right? In times of woe, when it's tough, with Trucar, for example, to prove the truth and transparency is a more profitable business model was not necessarily the most popular concept in the automotive industry in 2011. And the company went through a really tough, tough time. That mission statement was the North Star for everyone. Do we concede that value, even though it's unpopular to an industry that hasn't yet necessarily totally adopted the concept of transparency? And the answer is absolutely not. It's, it is the North Star. So, so in, in, in good times, it certainly guides your way, but also in bad times, very useful as a rallying cry for the entire organization as you're sort of having to do a lot of self-inventory about who you are as a company because you're being so challenged by an industry. And, and you know, right. and, yeah. and, and, for, and happily we came out the other side very, very successful. And especially for entrepreneurial organizations because they, you are typically short of money and yeah. there are a lot of shiny objects that yeah. you want to get hold of onto. So you might receive a certain uh, opportunity and say, let's jump at it. And you know, sometimes it does work, but most of the CEOs that I've talked with, and I've talked with hundreds of them, including Fortune 500 companies and Inc. 500 companies, and I realized that the ability to say no to things is far more important than what you do. And that can only come when you find a focus. And if you don't have a focus, you could uh, lose track very quickly. Yeah, I, I, I absolutely agree with that. Uh, and you know, the, the quote is, uh, you know, ideas without execution are really just a hallucination. And so, you know, when we when we think about you know 20, 2015 and the plan ahead, you know, to me the real opportunity is to think about uh, how can leaders uh, obviously galvanize their people around a common set of themes, but then more importantly, make sure that they have the tools in place to drive that execution. And you know, on on this call today, I've heard uh, reference to, you know, transparency and openness in the workplace and, you know, as driven by things like Facebook and Twitter and whatnot. And I actually think that there's a, a tremendous amount of opportunity remaining in how business leaders facilitate open dialogue, transparency around goals, uh, how, you know, they communicate to the organization around what's important and what are priorities and how frequently they do that. And so if I was, you know, a business leader of a, you know, medium to large business today, thinking about next year, you know, really my, probably my top priority would be, uh, do we have a clear mission and how do we connect every single individual in the company in terms of their expectations and objectives to that mission and how are we going to do that? Okay. No, wonderful. And, and, and to that point, I wanted to ask Matt a question because he mentioned emphasis and emphasis was an organization started by um, Narayan Murthy, and it actually transformed the entire country, so to speak, because that was that led to the revolution in, in outsourcing. In fact, I, I met Narayan Murthy at one time, so I know this in particular. And so the, one of the problems that Infosys had faced was a cultural problem, because uh, India was then a socialist country with a massive bureaucracy, and people's attitudes were very different. So, Matt, would you help us understand um, how emphasis actually changed the way things are done in organizations, organizations, large organizations in India? Sure. Well, the mission was very much central to electrifying the early employees and the founders of emphasis to kind of put the, their country on the map, you know, in a place where the power doesn't work most of the time. It was unthinkable in 81 when they started the company that you'd do software in a developing country where you couldn't even get a computer in the country. And so the, the founders living their values, living that mission and vision with great hardship to themselves for 10 years before Indian liberalization was a big, big inspiration to everyone around them. Because, you know, in India now is thought of as an outsourcing hub, but it wasn't in the beginning. And if you talk to the early customers like Nordstrom's, they'll tell you that the early employees were just on the edge of their seats. They were so driven, not only to make their company succeed and the customer succeed, but it was, it was almost like a national patriotic fervor. And I think it's become a role model for other companies these days in India to be more virtuous, ethical, uh, values-driven, margin-driven, entrepreneurial. Um, I, I think it's fair to say, and I'll defer to you, Nick, since you are Indian, 
that, you know, I think many Indians see them as a good role model in contrast with some more uh, family-based and less entrepreneurial orientations of the past. Yeah, absolutely. In fact, uh, the work ethic was very different, especially when I came here. I came 25 years ago. And so, so for me, when I, when I go back, I see a massive transformation in that country. And, uh, you know, emphasis transformed not, not just, uh, it's, it's not just about outsourcing, it transformed the nation to, to a large extent. Uh, they, they started their own universities because, you know, people coming in uh, from regular universities were really uh, not ready to work. I mean, they, they were talented, they were capable, but they had no readiness. And I think Infosys has one of the best uh, campuses as, as far as I can tell. Uh, and, and so their mission was more than, uh, more than just revenue. And so I think since you were head of the, uh, the leadership institute over there, you might be able to help us understand, you know, how such things were aligned with the mission statement of emphasis, which, which is uh, a, a very well reputed organization today. It's a great point. I th what you said is still true today. There are literally hundreds of millions of great Indians that don't have educational opportunity and can't perform at international levels. So I actually worked on a, the largest corporate university in the world. And, and part of that was part of the mission, the symbolism of this insanely great campus, something out of, you know, Mountain View or Cupertino, it, it, except it's in India, uh, where 50,000 youngsters would grow because the founder's mission is about an experiment in poverty reduction. And they did that. They created 10,000 U.S. dollar millionaires. They themselves are billionaires, you know, in a country where poverty is all around you. So that symbolism came to fruition, not only for the employees, as you said, Nick, but also for the customers. Because you can imagine in the early days to pretend like you could do world-class software in a developing country was laughable. But you take them to a place that's absolutely gorgeous, absolutely world-class in every sense of that term, and it changes the, the, the mission comes alive in the eyes of the customer as well. And the transformation is amazing. And, and if I may tell everybody else, Narayan Murthy was telling at that time that typically, and I know that, typically it took eight years to get a telephone line. So you apply for a telephone line and wait for eight years back then in the 1980s before you got a phone. And I don't think they had a phone initially. I don't know what happened, but I don't remember the details. But, you know, they went through hoops. But the, uh, you were saying that, you know, they, these were such dedicated people. So the mission galvanizes people. I, I get it. And in a smaller organization, it works. But when you look at a large company, what then? A staid, matured organization? Google, of course, certainly is very big. And, and we can take that example over and over, over again. But what about a staid company? G, for example. Or organizations that you've seen where you said, this is difficult. You can't just tell me a mission statement will work. How will the mission statement help larger organizations? Anybody? Well, I, if we're going to look at uh, Google specifically, by the way, uh, we work very closely with uh, key executives and board members from Google. And, uh, you know, one thing that Google does quite differently than most other very traditional companies is that everybody at Google, all 60,000 employees today, uh, have goals, and everybody can see everybody's goals, uh, and they actually encourage their employees to set stretch goals so that they're very they're thinking very big and very aspirationally around what's possible. And that kind of thinking has actually driven pro projects like Gmail or putting Wi-Fi in space and and many other you know amazing innovations for the com company. So, you know, I would be thinking about ways to kind of drive that openness and transparency and also encourage stretch and kind of ambitious thinking with, with the workforce. Cordell, you were saying something. We, um, things are speeding up and, and uh, working with, uh, talking with the chairman of Black & Decker, he said, I remember when we went from three to five year strategy sessions and now we're down to 12 months and thinking of going to six months. And so in, in the high-speed world we're in, what really sets you apart is your ability to address mass customization. And so what happens in the big General Electric is you make the plans at the top of level, at the very top of the, of the organization, and you pass those down with the expectation that there's a thing called commander's intent. 
uh, commander says, go take that hill, he knows that he's going to have people who get out there and there's a machine gun nest they got to get around. And so you've got to allow the employees the freedom and, in fact, plan on it, manage it for them to be able to make individual changes, keeping in mind the commander's intent, but given the market, being able to react quickly. And I think that'll become more and more the trend in the future is how do we empower the troops that are engaging the customer to customize and address those things the customer needs? Briefly, I, I read the other day a Disney security placement who approaches little girls in princess outfits that they bought in a gift shop and says, you must be a princess. Can I, can I get your autograph? Well, who thinks that way? Nobody at the top of Disney is thinking, how am I going to get a security guard to think about a, a seven-year-old girl in a princess uniform? And so that ability to pass that down is essential to creating the charismatic connection with customers. You know, this is, this is amazing. This, 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 yeah, sorry, okay. The issue of scale is fascinating, though. Chipotle is a really fascinating um, case for that because they you know talk about serving humanely raised meats um, i was recently at a conference where steve ells the the ceo and founder was there and john mackey the ceo of whole foods raised his hand and said hey steve how do we know that all your meat is humanely raised and and steve said well we still have to source some through through factory farming not all is but um mackey sort of persisted and said, do you have any third party audits? And Steve Ells said, no, we don't. You kind of just have to trust us. So you know that Steve Ells is a founder who really cares about serving humanely raised meat. Um, he has a challenge around scale. If he can't get enough of that meat, then he has to source through other means that may not be aligned with the mission and purpose of the company. Look at, you know, back to the start from Scarecrow to um, videos that were produced that have had incredible uptake uh, on, on YouTube in the tens of millions, right? So those are expressions of a mission and a value that does it get compromised at scale? So, so it's an interesting, it's an interesting tension. Um, but, and and, and I, while, while I absolutely agree with you, Lucas here, but what I, what Cordell said um, makes sense. How do you link a mission to strategy to execution? Well, for me. You know, at the CEO level, you, you're not uh, directly directing troops, and you shouldn't be. But at the same time, a system has to be in place for the mission to become operational. And I think therein lies leadership on part of the, the top honcho to say, well, okay, I identified my mission, but that is not sufficient. Even when you develop a strategy with your top team, you're going to say, how is it going to be executed? I can't be micromanaging anything. It shouldn't be micromanaging. But how do you empower your team to, to enable the execution of that mission statement like you gave this example of Disney or if you take an example of Coca-Cola, they talked about happiness being one of the core uh, 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 mission statement, uh, moments of happiness. And then you look at that they, they recently had a campaign where you can buy a Coca-Cola bottle with your name on it. And, and they are producing large scale bottles with multiple names and there's a massive uptake in demand. Now, obviously somebody, it may be high enough, but somebody came up with the idea because they were thinking and saying moment of happiness. How do you, how do I make my customer happy more than what you drink? Hey, my name is on it. I'm drinking and I'm sharing with my friends. I think that happens only when the culture is aligned with your yeah, but To keep the culture that way, Nick, you know, in a large, expansive GE or Disney or IBM, you know, leaders have to lead without physically being there. And they need infrastructure to maintain that culture, make sure that mission is getting executed. For me, and the way we did it at Infosys was through 360-degree surveys, computer adaptive. So to Cordell's point, we mass personalized by having these very sophisticated assessments of whether leaders are seen by their followers doing the behaviors that are consistent with the mission. And if they had gaps, a different game plan to help them grow that's just right for them, given, given what they have to do and given what the mission is. Without this science and technology, there's just no way, no way to scale it. It's too damn hard. There's too many different variables, and it's, it would be disempowering to do something else. So for, from my perspective, 
this is part of what inspired me to create my current company, to mass personalize this sort of stuff, to make it come alive for people on their smartphones, because they got that stuff with them all the day, all the time. At Infosys, unfortunately, you know, people get their assessment and they forget about it after the next week. But if it's on their smartphone, they got it, they can practice it, they can execute their mission-driven behaviors every day if they want. And also the transparency that's possible because of technology, everybody is saying, I am, it's not just a cubicle, I'm really, really visible. Whatever work I do, it's known to everybody, anyone who can tap into it, and therefore there's, there's an impetus, so to speak, uh, for people to confirm to the goals of the organization. And you don't really have to confirm. In fact, if you don't buy into it, then you probably need to be elsewhere. And so it enables the organization to, to really make it easy for the mission to percolate down the troops and, and, and back again to see, am I, am I acting upon it? So, so just the idea of you know, a mission statement being believable, inspiring, sweet spot, and all that stuff is all fine and dandy. And, and that needs to be, the, the, but, but ultimately you have to, when you dry, take your mission, you have to make sure it is authentic so that you can actually execute it. And then it, and then it gets to hiring people who believe what you believe and buy into the mission statement well drawn that is, that is easy for people to metabolize and then distributed power uh, in a more democratized management structure, but you've got to have managers who passionately believe in the values of the, of the and believe in the mission. Um, because at the end of the day, you're right. You can't legislate what a security guard says to a princess in a, in, you know, in a, in a, a gift shop at Disneyland. That has to come from the unique passion of somebody who loves, loves the, the mission statement. Yeah, and, and, and you know, uh, that is a change that has taken place in the last few years where you can't look at your employees as workers. You have to look at them as partners. There's no point hiring workers anymore. And when you hire partners, you want to make sure that there is an alignment. And if it's not, then it's going to scuttle the success of your organization. So, you know, there's this book called Zero Marginal Cost Society written by Jeremy Rifkin, who is an advisor to several uh, states of heads of state. And I had a wonderful conversation with him. He was talking about how the model is going to change from democracy to the collective. Mm. That the mm. collective is going to manage the organizations. There'll be several organizations and you can't think of a hierarchical structure of sorts. And this, this change is already uh, up and happening. And so organizations and individuals and entrepreneurs that latch onto that concept drive a lot more success for themselves than otherwise. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, um, thank you all. I really enjoyed the conversation with you and I hope the technology supports us and everything comes out well. Uh, would love to chat with you all again on another topic, but uh, I want to thank you, Lucas. I want to thank you, Matt. I want to thank you, Chris and Cordell. Uh, great having you on the show. Super fun. Thank, thank you. you. All right.